This episode of Long Night with Vish Khanna was recorded before a studio audience as part of the Long Winter Festival at the Polish Combatants Hall in Toronto on Saturday, December 9th, 2017. Coming to you live from the Polish Combatants Hall in Toronto, Canada, it's Long Night with Vish Khanna! On tonight's panel show, the Beavertons, Emma Hunter and Miguel Rivas are here! We have rapper King's Weapon! to the ground, Bichon Connor! Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the Polish Combatants Hall for a long night. It is our final episode of the year. Uh, as James mentioned, my name's Vish, and I, I don't want to brag, but I'm pretty sure we have the world's greatest audience here tonight. I told you guys, the world's greatest audience. It's true, it's our final episode of the year. It's uh, December 2017 as we're speaking to you. And I thought we would spend our time uh, taking a look back at the year that was or the year that has been 2017. And we have an excellent panel that's gonna guide us through all of this. And uh, I'm gonna introduce you to each of them right now. Cadence Weapon, also known as Roly Pemberton, is a Polaris Music Prize nominated rapper and producer who served as Poet Laureate of Edmonton his new self-titled album is coming out January 19th. By the way, it's already my album of the year for 2018. It's coming out on E1 Music Canada. Make some noise for Cadence Weapon! Emma Hunter and Miguel Rivas co-anchored The Beaverton, Canada's most edgy news satire show, which currently airs Wednesdays at 10 on the Comedy Network. Uh, Miguel is also the co-host of the monthly hit live show, Rap Battles at Comedy Bar in Toronto. How about a hand for Emma Hunter and Miguel Rivas? Thank you. Hello. Nice Hello. to see you. Nice Hello. To see you. Aliyah Pavani is the host of Canada Land's arts and culture podcast, The Imposter. Aliyah is trying to become a comedian so that she can do a live performance on stage at Second City to close out the season. So far, her epic journey has included crit sessions with pro comedians and an interview with her dad about brown face. And you can find those episodes on iTunes or online at canadalandshow.com slash IMP. How about a round of applause for Aaliyah Pabani over here? Yes! Thank you. Welcome. Thank you. Woo! And finally, James Keast is my sidekick and announcer on Long Night, and he is uh, also the editor-in-chief of Exclaim Magazine, which celebrated its, uh, or is continuing to celebrate, its 25th anniversary as a print publication in 2017. How about a, a round of applause for James Keast over here. <laughs> Woo! Nice to see you all here. How's everybody on the panel doing? We are ready to rock! Very well. <laughs> wow. Super lit. It's nice to have you all here. Now, oddly enough, we were here last year in the Polish Combatants Hall to wrap up the, the season, uh, the wrap up the year and assess the year 2016. Aliyah was here, you were on that panel. I was on that panel. Thank you for inviting me back. I guess my takes were really hot last year. <laughs> You're the only You're one back, except you. your brother, Miguel, Freddie was here. Oh my God. Stronger, better brother. We replaced the brother with yeah. the other brother. Freddy's I made the, the right star. choice. Freddy's Am I going to start a family feud here or something? No, I already won. It's all good. <laughs> <laughs> so what we, uh, we experienced last year, Leah and I, was that uh, 2016 seemed to be among the bleakest years on record. We decided, we had a fun talk, but it felt like things had really gone sideways last year. And I, I'm not sure if much has improved uh, over the course of the last 12 months. I think we'll start with Leah. Because we had that experience last year of talking about how terrible 2016 felt, do you feel like 2017 might have been better than 2016 in any measurable way? Well, I think, you know, the timing of this panel is significant because last year uh, Trump got elected and then everyone just died. Um, and so that's kind of what we were talking about mostly. And I feel like although 2017 we're still kind of hurtling towards disaster, um, like till end time, I guess. Um, it's, it feels better. Um, I think for me, I guess part of the thing was that 
um, Trump's election especially, made a lot of weird liberals uh, realize that institutions could uh, support abusers right. and that men in power could do horrible things and I feel like maybe in some way that paved the way for the series of dethronings that have really characterized 2017. So even though the like on a world scale um, things are still quite terrible, uh, personally I feel more optimistic right now. Okay. That's, okay, that's, that's good perspective. Now I'm going to open this up to the floor. Sure, you can applaud that. Hurling through end times with a smile on our face. That's what I uh, got out of that. Uh, let's open it up to the floor. How do other people here on the panel, maybe we'll start with Roly. You seem like you have something to say. What do you think? Um, yeah, it's, it's weird. Like, 2016 was uh, really bad. And then t this year seems like it's just continuing on the same downward trajectory. But um, I actually, in a weird way, I have a lot of optimism because... I think both years had a lot of um, a lot of difficult questions that people had to had to talk about, and a lot of painful uh, experiences uh, came to light. And I think historically, we have to go through these things to get to a better place. Yeah. So I, I honestly feel really positive about where things are going right now. I, I feel like we just are suffering from like uh, uh, some sort of outrage fatigue, or you know, like dismay fatigue. Where, whereas when Trump got elected, we, it kind of felt like a, uh, and to some degree, even though it was due in large part to denial, it was like some sort of bubble was burst. And then as things are just kind of bad all the time, you are shocked less and less, and you kind of get used to it. Yeah. So I feel like after we got used to it, we started to hopefully think about how we can make some change and address the situation that sort of crept up all around us while we were partially in denial. Yeah, I think that's true. You mentioned something about bubbles. Oh, you b both mentioned something about bubbles and how, you know, we were shocked out of our bubbles. I was thinking, like, bubbles are, are interesting, aren't they? Like, I, I think that some people were surprised by what had happened with the rise of the conservative movement. And, and, and like you say, in a weird way, Trump, as an evil person, was an agent of positive change. It sort of made people realize there's a whole other mindset out there I mean, it's been hard to process, but it's ultimately going to be healthy, don't you think? Are you looking yeah. at me? <laughs> um, yeah. I, I mean, yeah, in a weird way, if, if things would have gone maybe in the other direction, we might still have the status quo, right? Yeah, yeah. So there's one positive. <laughs> Frankly, like my... Really looking for silver lining. I know, that's just it. Just it. Like it is a rain cloud. But maybe, it but, is a rain cloud. But, but maybe all the people that have been speaking out feel compelled to do so because of that guy who's in power. Maybe it wasn't just Weinstein or whoever and people speaking out. Maybe they felt like enough is enough. We've got to speak out against all these guys. And maybe it's because of who they had in power down there. Maybe? I don't know. I'm just guessing. Yeah. I, I mean, I think that definitely set things off. I think the fact that somebody can be in power and having done all the things he had done already, that got people really thinking. Like, Yeah. Yeah, I, I'm, I am really optimistic, but I still, I'm still as I think we all should be very cautious about being optimistic because, uh, you know, even with all the changes we're going through and the dethronings and stuff, I have this weird feeling that elements of it are not going to stick the way we want it to. And I think, unfortunately, like everything else right now, it's personified in Donald Trump that he is, uh, has been uh, accused of so much abuse and he never pays the price for any of it in any way. So while we're dethroning other people, the most powerful person and the representative of the conservative side is not gonna pay any price and is yeah. gonna sort of devalue the sweep that, that society is making about this issue. Yeah, I feel like we're putting a, a, a slight tarnish on the optimism we expressed just Sorry. moments ago. I mean, and it's I, cautiously optimistic. Yeah. You yeah. know, like, I, I feel like um, we're still a tweet away from the apocalypse. <laughs> That's right. That's yeah. right. Does anyone here think 2017 was worse, by the way, in any way? Emma? Um, yeah, I mean, there's the, the notion of rock bottom is actually <laughs> positive when you think about it. Because That's, if you're yeah. at the lowest moment, the only way to go is up. And so I'm wondering when that really just like, just we're just going to just lean into the fucking rock bottom yeah, yeah. and start to go up. Because I don't know, I felt like this year was rough it was really rough to be a woman this year like i'm so tired man you know what i'm saying yeah and um and there's like just a bunch of dicks out there and i'm hoping that maybe 
as Aaliyah said, that with 20, the, the sort of cruising into 2018, there can just be like an upward swing on just like, just be cool <laughs> to women. That's it. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Um, yeah. Okay. So, All yeah. Right. All right. Well, you know, every year has its heroes and villains, and I wanted to talk about some of the best people uh, of the year and some of the worst people of the year. Just, to, you know, for fun. Just for some more fun. I, maybe we'll start positive. Um, Roly, who to you is one of the best people of the year? Okay, well, I have um, kind of like a few people in mind because I, I want to I wanna say the reporters from New York Times, obviously, who, who kind of set um, things into motion. Yeah. Um, but I, I also want to uh, shout out Colin Kaepernick, too, because yeah. I feel like... That's changed a lot as well. Like it's, it's with, with such a simple gesture, it's really shown the um, the lie at the heart of um, a lot of uh, organized culture in America. You know, and 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 so uh, Colin wasn't able to play this year, right? I mean, that's what happened. Yeah, he, yeah. He was, no, he was basically he was black, blackballed, blackballed, blacklisted. Yeah. yeah. It's funny that they call it that, eh? It is funny. <laughs> yeah, it is. But he's on the blacklist. In his stead, his. <laughs> That's good, I get it. In his he's, been stead, wh- he's been whited out. Uh, I don't think you're... Like a visual sp- image. That, that, I didn't mean what I, I said. I don't think you're allowed to say that. I know. Yeah, no. <laughs> I don't know. No, but what happened was, I, I mean, you cite him even though, I mean, I think he started uh, what he was doing last year, right? Yeah, yeah. But because he was blacklisted, blackballed, what have you, his colleagues, I guess, his fellow, his, you know, his fellow athletes... Took the answered his call. Yeah, I mean, like it's it's kind of a weird situation because he he in the NFL there's like a lot of people who are very like not qualified for their jobs, like a lot of people who play in the NFL, and for his position he would be like seventh best out of like eighty people sure. or something. But just because of him standing out and and not being like you know kind of an automaton and just like going with the flow. He's just being totally shoved to the other side, and it's uh, getting a lot of people talking. You know? What do you make of the uh, response uh, in opposition to what Colin Kaepernick uh, started? Because it seems to me that all the talk about him disrespecting the flag and the military is in itself a false flag, if you will. And I'm just curious if anyone has any thoughts on that. Yeah, I, and this is not an original thought that's my own, but I do have to, I, I, I wholeheartedly agree with it. What is the deal with the national anthem and guys with sort of no shirts on and painted chests? Why is this the place where it has to be sacred? Like, isn't there already like a level of joviality around the thing? Why is it in this moment that they have to be show the utmost respect. Why can't they use it as a moment to make a political statement? I, I don't know. I think it's sort of a, a great place to do that. It's yeah. a large gathering of people. It's in the name of something relatively light. I'm not that into sports, but I think sports are, you know what I'm saying? But the anthem is played before sports for why? I don't even know why. Right. Why, is, why are the anthems played before sports? Well, in the Olympics, it makes sense. In the Olympics, it makes sense. And like, even at a sports Yeah, the Olympics make, it. yeah, sure. But this is but like, like a hockey yeah, game or a like football a, game. But if they're all part of the same nation, it's confusing, like, who's supposed to be more inspired by it. And but how it, is Kaepernick being disrespectful by getting on a knee when the guy next to him has, like, a big red wig and his breasts and, out? And 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 the, his, the, it, the rules it, around <laughs> what you're allowed to do with the American flag, which, of course, extremely patriotic NFL fans are not aware of, are pretty strict. And they include not wearing them on clothes, not using them to sell anything. Yeah. It, it, the way that the flag is disrespected over and over again obviously is not the issue. No one cares about the right. actual flag until it's you know, within this situation. So right. are, are our rules about flag uh, distribution and use like more lax than they are in the States? Oh, Does anyone know time. about that? Yeah. Oh, yeah. oh man, they okay. love their flag there. Right. In America, they go crazy for their flag. I mean, like, shouldn't Ralph Lauren be illegal then? <laughs> yes. Okay. What What did Ralph? Wrap yes. that up for you. What did Ralph Lauren do? They have he it as the it's emblazoned on, on all of did their. He put the flag uh, on the underwear, did he? Oh my God, I didn't know that. All of their clothing. Oh, I see. Okay, well, I I just. I'm glad. To... I'm glad we just broke that open a little <laughs> bit for you. 
Somebody I tweet about that. They do the national anthem before the games because it's the ultimate uh, trigger for excitement and galvanization, right? That's why they do it. Well, they don't need to do the national anthem if they have stealth bombers flying over the stadium. Like, I feel like after you have stealth bombers flying over the stadium, the national anthem is like, whatever. You yeah, know? yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, okay. Anyway. Well, athletes actually hate the national anthem in most sports because you spend an hour warming up to play the sport and then you have to stand stock still for like 10 or 20 minutes right. or 15 minutes and you're like your body freezes up secretly like within sports all athletes hate doing that. How do you know this? You're not an athlete. Miguel's sort of good at basketball. No, no. Oh. I like it's to like play and I'm bad at it. <laughs> <laughs> Alright, we should move on. Are there any other heroes that people want to talk about uh, this year? Were there um, any other important... This is not uh, serious. It's a little bit of lightness in the sea of seriousness. But how great is it that there's going to be a black American divorced princess just like just right beside the Queen of England and Prince Philip oh. just sitting there. I'm just like, yeah, <laughs> stir it up. That's great. Right. That happened. That's a thing. That's great. That's, is that heroic? I wouldn't say they're the heroes of the year. But. Well, I'm excited about it, Miguel. <laughs> Right, a little yeah, uh, joy in the uh, she's a hero. sea of shit. Why is it significant that the 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 future? What is she? The future queen? I princess? think she's a princess. Yeah, Duchess. I can't keep Duchess. track. Why is it significant that she's black and divorced? I'm just curious why that's a. Because they're completely obsessed with all the wrong shit, bloodlines oh, right. and being British and you know things that have nothing to do with character. So she's just gonna go in there and switch it all up, and I just think it's. It's Anything to break up the incest that we assume <laughs> happens. Yes! <laughs> I just like the idea soul. of everybody freaking out in Buckingham Palace, just like losing their shit. It's wonderful. <laughs> okay, all Blood right. Bloodline monarchies are awful and extremely oppressive, so anything that yeah. will... Um, anything that will mess that up yes, a bit. I was not up. expecting that to get a cheer. That's amazing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Whoops. She used to live here. That's so right, yeah. Shout out to the six. Shout right. out to the six. <laughs> right. We What's, did it. Does anyone I, heard that, I heard that Harry went to the, uh, this is a rumor, allegedly, I heard that Harry went to the big uh, Danforth Halloween thing that they do over there in a mask. And he didn't oh. have security. Oh, yeah. Wow. Allegedly. <laughs> I did not know this was going to go this way. He seems all right for an otherwise shitty family. <laughs> does anyone have anything to say about the, the Me Too campaign? Not to switch gears radically, but oh. I know that came up in my... Notes uh, when I, I was corresponding with uh, some of you. Does anyone want to speak to that? In terms we'll of, speak uh, to that, advocacy? won't we? I mean, you, you can go ahead. I don't well, know I mean, what more there is to what, say. Well, yeah, that. what else is there to say other than um, it's very exciting. It's about time. I feel like change is actually happening. I feel like there's a movement happening. It's very exciting to be a part of that movement. And um, the sisters are pissed. Look out. Yeah. I yeah. have a thing that might not be like the most gentle take on this and Go. the whole <laughs> Do it. I guess I'm just like I think that it's yeah it's it's incredible and it's important that people are speaking out against um, sexual violence and like their experiences around that in the workplace and in their lives and I really hope that a larger conversation around all the ways in which men can be abusive <laughs> uh, opens up around that um, I just feel like there are a lot of men virtue signaling and calling out rapists and it's really hard for me to see um, because it just feels like we're recognizing this thing that's like very overtly horrible and uh, we're still often in situations where we have to walk into a workplace full of men who are talking about um, rapists in a very callous, like uns insensitive way. Um, and I think that... You mean they're trying to um, interact with the phenomenon and the situation, yeah. but they're not doing it with sensitivity? Yeah, like they're not recognizing that there are women in their workplace, which is like par for the course, I guess. Yeah. That, um, so, yeah, I don't know. I just feel like there are a lot of things about this year that feel really regressive to me around like representation and racism. And, you know, a year ago I was trying to have conversations around the subtle, nuanced ways in which racism exists, and now we're back to discussions around Nazi racism. Yeah. And I feel like, as positive as it is that these things are visible, I want us to be able to like get to where I thought we should be. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> faster. That's true. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I, I I think that it's like like Rolly said, like uh, Caden's weapon said earlier, it's like the the white 
nationalist racism that we're seeing surge across the planet. Um, I always, I'm still wondering how much of it is, is a, like a real surge and another part of it is like popping the blister of something that was already there. Like yeah. we have to just kind of, like I, I like to think that Donald Trump's election is the high water mark of what this movement is gonna do. Mm -hmm. And it's like the last flailing gasp as that the, the power is completely sapped out of that. I don't think this is happening. I'm like hoping that this is what will happen. Um, but I, yeah, I, I like to think that it's the, the visibility that it gained, the white nationalist racist movement, will also be what helps to destroy it. I, because um, part, of, part of the insidious version of this racism was that it was all around and we didn't and we and it wasn't being addressed um right. so the fact that we're addressing it as difficult as it is and as ugly as it is hopefully i don't know i like to think it's that which again i know I, I i clumsily tried to address this earlier but that seems to be the this you say we're we're cl we're clamoring for silver linings a little bit but that this exposure is is seemingly helpful on some level because we're actually dealing with the actual issues, they're not just sitting beneath the surface. We all have to confront them. And I think that when I was talking about bubbles earlier, I think that the reason intellectuals didn't take, say, Trump seriously is because they thought, really, it's 2016. Like, yeah, why do we have to talk about sexism and racism anymore? Well, who's still doing that? Right? And that's what we... So many. Right. And, and that's why it's, I, in a weird way, it's positive that these people have these platforms right now and are getting this exposure because we can readdress these situations that we thought were kind of resolved. Yeah, and it's just an ongoing battle is what I think maybe the like, the, the pop culture phenomenon of it is, is maybe like glossing over. Like I said before, something about the Me Too campaign is that people will get fatigue over the shocking things um, and we just can't have that happen. We have to sort of... Yeah. 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 Okay, well, we have to move on to the uh, worst person or people of the year. Uh, it's very important that we get to the worst person or people of the year. And I, I, as I said, I surveyed some of you over email. I got some answers I expected. Uh, Trump, Mike Pence, Harvey Weinstein, uh, Roy Moore, Louis C.K. One of the ones that surprised me, well, didn't surprise me personally because I feel the same, but Lena Dunham came up. And yeah, I'm not, I've never been a fan uh, of Lena Dunham, I have to say. Ali, I hate to put you on the spot, but I believe that was you, right? Yeah, yeah. it was. Can you, now I bring it up because at one point, I think she was seen as a <laughs> real ally, and now that is not the case. Is that fair to say? Because of her various words and actions, it's been <laughs> difficult to see her in a positive light, right? I mean, I think that she is given many, many, she has been given so many passes. I, I don't remember who tweeted this, but they just made a collage of all of the headlines where Lena Dunham apologizes for things she said. And it's just, <laughs> it's like, you know, it's notable to me that she's still, like, nothing she says is uh, too heinous to apologize for later and still maintain her position. Yeah. I remember when Girls first came out and people were like, you know, where are the, like, black characters in your show? Like, where are the people who aren't uh, wealthy? And I was like, we don't want this person writing those characters. And I was right, because on the second season of Girls, she had a black character, and it was, like, this horrible Republican that she, like, dated for a minute. And, and, and it was it, Donald Glover, It was Donald it? Glover. Yes. Yeah. 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 That's, yeah. yeah. I guess I just, like, like, I think that her politics are just bad, and... Uh, but she keeps being able to be taught and to apologize publicly, but it doesn't really result in her not being the voice of a generation. Yeah, and I think she distinctly <laughs> doesn't acknowledge that she comes from an extreme place of privilege yeah. and that that's a massive problem. So your sort of, your whole system doesn't work unless you acknowledge who you are and where you came from. And she's, yeah. A There's bit. like no learning. So yeah, her most recent apology, I guess, was that she uh, basically her writer was accused of sexual assault and she defended him. She stood by him, yeah. yeah. I, I, I don't know if this is a tangent necessarily, but we are in this weird space right now, like as we're speaking, where many progressive, seemingly cool people have 
been proven to not be so. And I wonder if that's what's going on there. Wait, who else, Vish? Al Franken. Yeah, who else? Oh, sorry. I'm just thinking of like people like <laughs> Franken, Louis C.K., I guess, you know, for what it's worth. We're, we're, I think we're coming into an era of the fake woke. Yes. <laughs> this the is this woke. is the time yeah, of like fake wokeness yeah. of like the kind of like uh, the virtue of signaling but for like being um more more with it than people actually are like it's yeah. it's, it's 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 an epidemic yeah. currently. Yeah. And, and and people are calling out the fake wokeness. That's true. I never thought of it that way. There's a weird thing too with the comedic angle because Miguel and I are obviously fans or were fans of Louis and and it's weird because this sort of coupled with the Woody Allen stuff, they're, they're telling us all the time through their art who they are. Manhattan is a very fucked up film. Yeah. Louis' stand-up, watching it now, he's telling us every, like, he tells us, this is what I'm doing, this is what I'm about, and it's horrible, and it's not okay, and it's not charming, and it's not funny. Um, and I think they gotta go. And I don't think the art gets to stay because the amount of people that didn't get a voice because of these guys is... It's a problem. Yeah. Yeah. It's just also there there are no heroes and we have to kind of like I think we haven't arrived there as a society yet. We need to sort of take down the image of people being perfect. I mean in politics that's always been the idea is that someone who's going to run is going to be this image of a perfect person. And uh that ultimately leads to us being extremely disappointed when yeah. everyone is proven not to be. They're just and human it, and beings. it involves yeah. people getting away with things that they shouldn't. Uh, and yeah, we, we need to let we need to let ourselves understand that nobody is a hero. That's well put. And then put. we won't have these people to be to destroy at, from such a high level. Yeah, that's it's well put. Uh, we have to take a quick break, but before we do, does anyone else want to chime in about the the worst person or people of the year? Anybody on the panel? I uh, yeah, I mean. I just wanted to say, just um, my answer is men. <laughs> Period. Mm-hmm. You know, like st- we have to start over. Yeah. Aww. Not this year. All the years. All of the years. Maybe next year not, but probably again. We have to start so. over. Okay. All right. We're gonna take a quick break. Uh, more to come with this amazing panel online. Long night. Please stick around. Don't go anywhere. Thank you. We're back, back on Long Night. All right, we've had a spirited discussion thus far. I want to move on to something a bit lighter, uh, the best pop culture event or figure of the year. Oh, that was supposed to be Meghan Markle for me. Shit. This, this will be okay. I, I, I categorize this as anything in books, films, TV, music, sports, comedy. And uh, last night, because Roly recommended it, I checked out a film called Get Out. Has anyone, anyone seen Get Out in the audience? Yes. Wondering why I only saw it last night? I'm sorry, I'm a parent. I don't have time to go see he, movies. He's got kids. He's got a reason why he didn't. I couldn't. I, couldn't. I really wanted to see it, but I couldn't see it. I haven't seen a lot of movies. Uh, Roly, what is it about Get Out that, uh, that uh, changed the year for you? Um, when I first saw Get Out, it felt like finally... Um, it was the first movie I've seen that I can really think of where there was a black protagonist and he just got to be a person. Honestly, it's like so many movies. I go to the movies and it's just like, you know, like Goodwill Hunting or some shit. And it's just like not, it's not for me, right? And just like seeing everything that happened in the movie, it just felt like this was just like all the microaggressions. This is the first time I ever saw this in a, in a film where they, where they show like all the things that I've always told all my white friends that happened to me. <laughs> and uh, I was like, see, this is on the screen. This is real. It's not just me. You know, I'm not, I'm not crazy. Yeah. And it's turned that into a horror movie. And it's, and, it's, and it's not just a horror movie. It's like, I don't know. It, it's definitely a, a film that resonated with me a lot. Do you think there, uh, it, it came out at the right time? Like, it, does it fit sort of like a temporal? Like, is, is it important that it's out right now? Oh, yeah. I mean, I guess it, originally it was supposed to come out earlier when, you know, there was the, the epidemic of black men being killed by the police in America yeah. more, more in the news. Um, but then the fact that it came out after that, it gives a lot more context to how it ends and stuff and what, what the audience's expectation 
for when you know a cop car comes. You know, it's not necessarily always a good thing. Right. You know, I mean, I, Jordan Peele recently. I mean, the film has been nominated for uh, a number of awards, I believe, and he tweeted uh, because it was nominated as a film, like a horror film or a dramatic. Film. Uh, yeah, it was. It was in the um, comedy. Comedy. In, uh, Golden Globes. That's it was in the right. Comedy. Yeah. Even we, worse. We, I, it's a total technicality. Like it's just like anything that isn't like, like a drama. Drama. Everything else is comedy, but it's it's strange. I but it's weird it. because for him, he he, he in, in an interview he says it's a documentary. Yeah, he tweeted that, and I agree. It should be in the documentary category. Yeah, uh, Leah, you saw Get Out as well, did you not? I did. What did you make of it? Well, I thought like it was just like a redefinition of the genre. Like one of the first things that happened. Uh, when I, when I first saw it, one of the first things I noticed was just, there's this thing that happens in movie theaters in India where people just yell at the screen and they really, like, there's no screen. You're just, like, hanging out at a party and someone's being chased by someone and you're like, fucking run, like, you know? And that never really happened in Canada much and I, it was really something I missed when I moved back from India to here. Huh. And Get Out, I went to go see it in a theater in Mississauga and it was, like, no white people in the theater and everyone was just, like, throwing popcorn and screaming at the at the screen and I was just like, ah, oh, yes. <laughs> so it was the experience as yeah. much as the film itself. Yeah, just the experience yeah. of watching in theaters, which you missed out on, Vish. Um, I don't know if iTunes um, I bought it off for of that. iTunes for twenty one ninety nine. <laughs> I didn't even torrent it or anything. I'm such an idiot, I guess. But I was just like, I don't want to fuss with all that. You should just... watch it with like a holographic POC audience. Honestly, I was so unsettled by it like 15 minutes in. I was telling Roly that I almost turned it off. What? It's what were you made in... so well. Like it's yeah. so visceral as a film. You got scared. I got scared. I also, that, that sl- first scene, like that first scene, if I didn't oh pay, I would have needed to pause and like go to the bathroom or yes. something. That it was, was yeah. And uh, Jordan Peele, I was just telling Roly, like I just found out he's like involved in the reboot of the Twilight Zone, which mm-hmm. if you've seen Get Out, now it made more sense to me now that yeah. I've seen it, yeah. Okay, uh, who else has something to say? Oh, Miguel, you mentioned The Big Sick. A lot of yes. films came up, The Big Sick. Yeah, pop culture, man, <laughs> films, movies, books. Um, <laughs> no one picked records, I don't think. No one picked one record. No, we lost the monoculture. What, what is a record? I'm what sorry. the fuck are you talking about? I, yeah. I buy shit off iTunes and I listen to records. Give me Grammys a break. has record and song and it's like, what yeah. is what is my, going on? No one picked music, I'm no. just saying. My Everyone computer just music. plays the songs and I just yeah. listen to it. <laughs> what is an album even, man? It's a playlist. <laughs> The Big Sick, uh, you also like The Big... No, who liked The Big Sick? You liked The Big Sick? I liked The Big Sick. Um, I thought it was was really funny, um, and I thought that it was uh, representative in a great way. I think that in this particular time... Not to drag everyone back to... In this particular time of uh, uh, racism, I think that Muslim Americans uh, and Muslim Canadians are, are not really depicted as normal human beings. And I think The Big Sick is based on a, a true story and is it's just a story that could have happened to anyone. And you you, know, the sorry, film is sort of whitewashed for a wider audience, yeah. but I, I think that that is a successful thing to do when depicting uh, Muslim Americans. And, I, and I, thought it was ve- I just also thought it was a very good film. I should have said, for people who haven't seen it, can you summarize it a little bit? Like, what, what is the, it's a com- uh, yeah, it, it's, that is actually a comedy, technically, right? Yeah, it's a, it's a comedy. Uh, you don't want to give away too much because it's like very plot-based yeah. as it goes, but um, it's, it's about a guy who starts dating a girl and uh, she gets very sick and he has to kind of navigate her getting sick and, and interacting with her family. Um, and yeah, the less you know from that point, probably okay. the more enjoyable it would be as a comedy. Now, I understand uh, Aaliyah, who is amazing, an amazing person, I think has a <laughs> potentially different perspective. That's, cr- that's, that's what this is all about. On the big six. So what, what's going on with the big six? Okay, I will, I will lighten this uh, criticism by saying that when I went to it, I laughed at it. And I was like, this is a funny rom-com. And then, when I was leaving the theater, I was just like, oh, there's this really terrible feeling that I have in my whole body. And um, it was because, so, like, the depiction of his parents as, like, single-mindedly focused on, like, him having an arranged marriage and almost to, like, the extent to which they were, like, completely callous and like one-dimensional human beings like I feel like true representation for Muslims will come when like the Muslim family depicted is anywhere close to Muslim families that 
I have and I know. And I think the thing that like I've realized about arranged marriage is like if you're gonna get into some kind of like statistically batshit arrangement, like getting married, then you might as well have everybody chiming in on it because it's so unlikely to be running on love for your whole life that like if they had a way to actually humanize the parents, like there are, like, I, uh, sorry, I'm rambling, but um, my friends, uh, one of my friends is like, she comes from a long line of like family members who have had arranged marriages and that were successful. And a lot of people who are actually in arranged marriages talk about how like, you know, uh, when you recognize that marriage is kind of like an institution, we say that all the time, but we don't understand what it is. It is like, like I don't, I, I don't, I wouldn't get married for any other reason but citizenship, but if I was, I would want people putting me with someone that has the highest likelihood of, um, working with me and I just felt like that movie was full of things like that that felt really like Judd Apatow interventions um, like very typical Muslim family stuff like the mother trying to disown her son which would like never happen um, like if there's anything that's true about they see moms is that they love their sons like even if their son like dragged home like a dead person they'd be like you know you're perfect so I don't think that's true. <laughs> that might um, be an overstatement. But also, like, so our Hari Kondabolu just came out with a movie called The Problem with Apu, and I don't know. Yes. Is I saw it out? It. I, okay. I've seen so, that. I didn't even have to buy that so one. So now, now one. we should all be literate about patanking, which is just like these brown characters being like kind of minstrel characters uh, that have like really thick accents that are not. Um, regional, they're just like these like caricature-ish Apu accents yeah, yeah. and that movie was full of those things right. and I just felt like the brown people in that film were so dehumanized um, and like the white parents were portrayed, even though they made like 9-11 comments, they were portrayed as so much more human than the brown parents were and I just felt like that was such a missed opportunity and I think that like I wish Kumail Nanjani all the best, but again, like if we're at the point where we're applauding a movie just because it has a brown guy who wasn't born in the U.S. in it, who wrote it, like, is this the 90s? I'm like, yeah. we need to expect better. Okay. I think too, can I comment? Yes. I think a lot of the time with sort of what's going on in these movements and sort of issues with racism and misogyny, I think a lot of the time the wrong people have the microphone. Like I don't think Judd Apatow is the guy to make the film to start to piece it back together. I just don't. He's just a white guy that grew up in California. But it is Kumail's idea, right? Like Kumail, yeah. I mean, I know what, we all probably know what it's like to work with uh, overlords who have the money. You know, they ultimately have the final say. Apatow would be one of these overlords, but I kind of, and by the way, I've, I've yet to see the big Curious sick, choice sick. of word there. Yes. Beesh. Which which one? <laughs> Overlord? Yeah, I don't know why I went with that one. <laughs> I'll edit it out later. Um, no, I was going to say that uh, I believe that he drew most of these things sort of from his experience, and like, do you have any experience with arranged marriage talk from your family? Because I, I once do went you? down to the basement, and uh, I found some like Indian trade newspapers, and under some of the arranged marriage stuff, things were highlighted. <laughs> <laughs> Anything I good? was very scared to go down to the basement after that. <laughs> what are they plotting up there? What am I doing? So I just know that that is, it was like a threat almost. Right. Your, hey, your grandparents are on the phone. They found someone for you to marry. Like yeah. that's something I would get. Right. So I kind of can relate to that. And maybe, has anyone here been in an arranged marriage? That's what I thought. And Once have you? I have not, <laughs> but okay, so I, like I can't even, I can't even list a source for this because I can't remember where I read it, but I, but I read somewhere, and you should edit this out because it can't be fact-checked, <laughs> but <laughs> that... Oh, it's staying in. That no, just there was less tension between Kumail and his parents yeah. in real life than there was in the film. Yes. And like, why build that in, Judd Apatow? Like, why try to create... You know how to make a successful film, but, like, on the backs of what? Like, do we, you know... Is, is there more tension because the audience just expects these kinds of characters and they want to be made to feel superior because yeah. love marriage is their thing? Right. Uh, Miguel, I hate to put you on the spot, but, you know... Alita's do you love your wife, Miguel? I love my wife. She's not sick. She's fine. Does that change the impression, your impression of the movie, just hearing what Aliyah had to I say? I mean, yeah, I, I, absolutely. I, I, I don't even feel like it's my, like, 
I don't have a response necessarily because I agree with sure. everything that's being said. My, my only thing would be to say that the rom-com machine is like a disaster anyways, and to see it penetrated in any way it, I think is I think is is penetrated. Sort of, no, what, wait, yeah, I'm sure. Nice. Sure, I'll stick with that. Um, I think it's I think it's admirable. Who are you, Judd Apatow? Nice. Oh, it penetrated. Oh no. Um, I think it's admirable in some way, even if it, it missed the mark in several ways. And if it really missed the mark, then I I I need to check how I view this the thing as well. But uh, yeah, I did come away with a sense of of moderate positivity. Also, it's like 40 minutes too long. Right. <laughs> it's a classic Apatow movie. What would you, you cut out of it? Um, <laughs> probably like a lot of the uh, stuff with Ray Romano in general. Um, I don't know what it is there for. You, uh, yo, <laughs> Ray Romano is in this movie? Yeah, he's, man. He's the dad. He's <laughs> Ray Romano. He's Emily's dad or the and whatever. Ray Romano. Yeah. And the, as a non-fan of Ray Romano, I'll say too. that he does, o- he does okay. Does everyone love him in the movie? Ah. Um, no. Okay, Thank good. God. It's nice. more, uh, that's a more accurate depiction of real life. Not everybody loves him. Okay, we should move on. Does anyone else want to talk about anything they loved uh, pop culturally? Well, yeah, I, I, that kind of reminded me of something, the fact that this movie was from Judd Apatow like, in the back. And I think some of the most successful movies this year are uh, coming from new perspectives. I think that's a, a, a new thing that's happening in movies and, 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 in, and in TV where you see like a film like Get Out or like Lady Bird where it's like, you know, you're giving someone a, a, a chance to give their full voice, you know? And, yeah. and I think that's going to be something that's going to be happening more in the coming years. Okay. Does anyone want to talk about uh, the worst stuff they experienced, consumed? Anyone do a, a, anyone hate something so much that they want to talk about it? That, you know, something that happened this year. I responded um, Will Smith's new song, Get Lit. But, uh, but then as soon as I sent that off, I was like, I actually like, enjoyed how, how bad I thought it was. Now, I haven't heard this Will Smith song. It's so funny. It's, so, it's just such like an old person's <laughs> attempt to make like, current young music and using young vernacular, and it's so, Miguel, so bad. Is this something I can purchase on the iTunes? I, I, I listen to all the rap. This, <laughs> this, didn't, this didn't make it to my radar. <laughs> Oh, oh, man. I saw the new... I, I'm happy to tell you, you should go home and look up Get Lit can by you... Will Smith and Jazzy Jeff. Can... Oh, he's... it's oh, with yeah. Jeff. They're back together, man. Whoa, Why cool. Why isn't he the Fresh Prince? Now, that, now we're Smith? talking. Yeah. Yeah, I'm kind cool. of more excited. Cool. <laughs> yeah, that sounds good to me. Can Come you re... on, y'all. Get Lit. That's the... Check it out. That's it. Terrible. Keep That's it going. The... Anything else? What else is there? Is there anything bad? Oh, uh... Someone mentioned the Kardashians. Oh, which... that's me. I'm done. Well, who's Enough. When were you ever I was in? never. I was never. But can we just, they're just, it's just, re- it's just a problem. It's right. just for, like, I have this, my friend just had a new baby daughter, and I'm like, can she please, I just need them to go on an ice floe and just what do you mean, float your away. Just, oh, your friend just had a baby daughter, and yeah, that would be who and they the, would be I looking just, up I to? Yeah, and I get nervous about the, yeah. the two younger ones with the, and the, and it's so much image and, like, just, like, just like sex face all the time yeah. for young women. It's just like it, it, it just we need a new plan. Plus they Enough. ruin they ruin Kanye West. So oh well, that's, that's his. I disagree. Really? He's already really? crazy. You don't think so? I disagree. You don't, I don't think know, they man. ruined life? Him? Of Pablo was like was you know yeah, red hot. Okay. Last album. All right. That's fine. True. Fine. All right. I think they broke him. He seems broken now. He broke himself if he's broken. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Let's give him some credit for breaking yeah, himself. Yeah, you're probably right. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I don't I, know if there's anything that you want to talk about. I had something I didn't oh, say before. Yes, go ahead. In that, that I want to say is my um, thing I don't like pop culturally, uh, and it is controversial. Um, Stranger Things. Okay. I don't like it. Mm. Okay. I think it's super Let's overrated. Talk about it. It's derivative. Uh, they Ooh. have the one black character. Is I hate shit like that. Mm-hmm. Uh, Explain. Oh, but well, you are explaining. I, I watched the whole first season too, so it's not like I didn't try. But I don't know. I just found it like, listen, like I grew up in the 80s. You yeah. know, like I, I, I saw all those movies already. Like, I, I don't know. I don't like when people try to like prey on my childhood interests and shit like that. Do you that. have a sense of why that's taken off then? Because I've mostly heard this response, like derivative. It's not doing anything. I don't know if it's, I, maybe it's not for me or something. I, I, think it's try, I think you're right. I think it's trying to capitalize on nostalgia and that it's too easy of a trope. And that, and that you probably sit there going like, no, I see through this shit. I, you're not getting me. It's like Disney. It's like, I see you, Disney. 
I see you playing those songs reminding my childhood. It's not that good. Yeah. Um, so I think it's probably something like that. Also, Winona Ryder is terrible. Is she bad? Whoa, something's, yeah. I was like, I was sitting with my husband. I was like, turns out she's uh, terrible. Yeah. Oh, I, I feel that, that um, as like culture has lost a lot of touchstones and sort of, um, you know, commonality, like everyone doesn't like the same song or even know the same song anymore. Um, as it's sort of... <laughs> get lit, we got it. Get lit, everyone, I mean, besides... No one yeah, knows get it. Lit. Yeah, besides I, get I think lit, that yeah. as we've sort of lost the, the monoculture um, yeah. rapidly in the age of the internet and, and technology kind of spreading out, I think that culturally we've gone to this thing where we're just like gouging our own nostalgia. Mm -hmm. And it's like a pretty specific timeline that we're gouging. And there's only so much we can get out of it. Um, and I think that Stranger Things is... Like, one of those examples of something that is just a list show. Yeah. Uh, like, specifically superhero movies, I always called, like, list movies. Because people show up being like, does he have the suit? Okay. <laughs> is, he, is he angsty? Okay. Did yeah. his parents get killed? You know, it's just like, no one's going there to be like, take me somewhere, show me something, teach me anything. It's like, you're going there with these set expectations. And I think that's a result of our, like, awful nostalgia culture. And I'm, uh, I would like to take it down in any way I can. <laughs> All right. We have to take another quick break. We're running out of time, and I want to get to some more stuff. But we'll take a very quick break. Back with more on Long Night. Please stay where you are. Thanks for being here. <laughs> We are back. We don't have very much time left. I want to talk about a few things. Uh, social media, real quick. Is Twitter dying? I wonder if Twitter... I, I keep hearing that people want to leave the service. I keep hearing that people... You know, there was a boycott recently. I, I feel like Facebook is dying. No, no, no. They said that about Facebook like 10 years ago, and it's fine. I'm on Facebook. I know what's hip. But the Twitter, I feel it's like fine. the Twitter. I'm on it, so it's the Twitter fine. is run by trolls, and like it's horrible. It's a horrible experience if you go on Twitter and say something. If you said any of the things we've said on stage here today, you'd be greeted with a lot of uh, resistance, and it would be I ugly. Don't, I don't have those people on my Twitter. Probably us less, you know. <laughs> we sure. Well, okay. Them. So when um, like the Rose McGowan bannings um, yeah, caused a lot of people to boycott yeah. Twitter. There were a lot of people of color who came on Twitter and were just like, we're not going to boycott this because it's still like such a strong network. Like black Twitter, indigenous Twitter, like all these like very um, strong voices that kind of came together with Twitter make me think that maybe it's over for some, but not for others. Okay. And a lot of those people are the ones who are getting like the, the brunt of the abuse, but I see a lot of tweets from people who are very engaged Twitterers, and they're just like, "I'm so sick of this. I'm so I just wish people would tweet pictures of food again." You it's know, like a bad tweet though. What's that? <laughs> do people actually tweet that? They're like, "Oh, I'm so tired of this." They meme. do actually. Like, I, oh. I, 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 I'm on the Twitter, and I see what people are saying. Is anyone How like many an likes early? On that tweet? I don't. A lot. Usually yeah. a lot. Yeah. People are. I'm just saying. There's. Uh, this is news to you, eh? There's an exhaust. I I'm mean, noticing more of an exhaustion than I thought there would be. I, I feel like Twitter, um, the, the way that it's worked its way into the news media and journalism, I don't think is ever going to go away because the pace that, at, at which news happens is currently best uh, shown and best spread out through Twitter. Yeah. And that's through like, you know, legitimate main news media, but also other networks and stuff. And so I think that alone, maybe it's a less fun place to be. It's less of just uh, a comedy haven, but... Its role in the news is is expanding, if anything, I think. Okay. You know, if they kick the Nazis off, it'll be fine. Yeah, it would be much better. But that's, what, that's what they're saying. Like, that's yeah. why people are like, I can't do this. They're actually, they're not kicking the Nazis off. They're not kicking the troll, the alt-right trolls off for saying horrible things. I heard they were going to change uh, the verification system. They have de-verified many Nazis. Yeah. I can't believe I said that in the year 2017. But they have done that, so there's that. Okay. Jack yep. of Twitter, the the at Jack. Yeah. He, he even follows some of the worst trolls on Twitter. That's right. And has never spoken to why that is, yeah, or how that came to I'm be. I'm just so saying, don't be surprised if it's know. done. That's what it's my prediction. It's, it might be done. It's funny that they changed it to 280 characters because he's saying less and less about it. Right. You know about what's actually happening right. on Twitter. Yeah, mm. it's true. 
We have to do a bit of a lightning round here. Best worst thing about being Canadian in 2017. I just am curious if anyone can speak to their experiences and, uh, and, and their perception of Canada. We've talked a lot about American culture, I feel like. Uh, I think, well, the best thing about being Canadian in 2017 was, um, uh, you know, you know, it's cliche to say, but yeah, not being American, obviously, just with all the erosion of the civil liberties and all the bad shit that was happening. But the the worst thing, though, is that um, you have all these super smug Canadians yeah. saying exactly what I'm saying. So it's <laughs> you're the worst thing about being Canadian. Yeah, I'm I'm the worst thing about being Canadian. Yeah. Yeah, I think I think the worst thing is kind of people not realizing that, that a lot of the things that we hold ourselves superior over the United States also go on here and are not being addressed. Um, and so the smug thing of being Canadian is like pretty easily uh, punctured and burst and I, I hope that we're, we're going to get a- aware of that more so as a society. Yeah, and it's not good enough. We're such a great country and our greatest strength is our diversity, I think. And I think it always has been and it always will be. And I think that there are huge issues with that. And as long as we're not the states, we sort of can lay low and nobody's looking at us. But we have big, big problems with that. The indigenous situation is abominable yeah. and inexcusable. And we can do better. I re- and I think we really can as a country if we just pay attention to it. You know, because Miguel and Emma, your roles on the Beaverton are to kind of skewer Canadian culture. and Professional idiot. And, <laughs> and the news... Has that uh, helped you engage with the country a bit differently, just being the anchors of our preeminent news satire show now? Well, the comment sections are fun. That's wow. for sure. Wow, wow. Uh, the Facebook comment sections are fun. Um, yeah, yeah, it's I interesting mean, what people go for. It. It's, uh, I'm always, uh, it's always aesthetics for me that <laughs> I'm uh, fat or a slut or Jesus. have to fit. Yeah, and for Miguel, it's always to do with sexuality. It's, uh, it's rough out there, but then there's also positive things. There's uh, people that get excited about uh, our sort of left-leaning take on things and the fact that it's pretty cutting and we don't hold back. And, uh, and yeah, I think it, it changes the way we read the newspaper. That's for sure. Okay. Yeah, we definitely, you definitely have to follow the news very closely to our own detriment sometimes to, uh, doing the show. And, and punch up. Yeah, and every, every time the temptation to wear like this, we just can never go towards that. It always has to be... Uh, mocking the bully. It can never be mocking the bullied. Right. Always, I think always, we're always. during a time where we're learning a lot about what it means to be Canadian and how to sort of refocus that in, in uh, this century. And so, yeah, through making fun of it all the time is a good way to learn about that. Okay. All right. We're going to wrap this up with uh, predictions and hopes for the new year, for 2018. Now that we're... I mean, did we resolve it? Do we feel good about 2017 in the end? I feel like we're on balance. That's my reading of this. It was good. It was bad. It was probably better than the year before. Yeah, it was just another year. <laughs> yeah. Just an- yeah. Just another one? Just okay. a different set of numbers, man. I mean, there's still <laughs> some days left. And frankly, listen, 2017 will be good if we make it all yeah. the way to the end of the year and I get to see the new season of Black Mirror. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's the 28th. We are under the threat of nuclear holocaust on Twitter all the time. Yeah. So that's not good. Okay, so I'm going to ask everyone on the panel to uh, provide uh, at least one 2018 prediction or hope. And within that, feel free to plug something that you've got coming up in the new year or something you want people to know about. So why don't we start with Aaliyah? (laughs) Actually, James? Start yes. Do you want to do you want to say anything? I can <laughs> I, I can speak. Yes, please do. Uh, I'd like to say uh, my pop culture hero was Tiffany Haddish. Uh, my worst thing of the year was getting sucked back into an M Night Shyamalan movie, <laughs> uh, Split, which in I which because promises were made okay. and those promises were obviously not fulfilled, and I can't believe I watched another movie about a idiot kidnapping young women in basements. So I feel bad about that. My prediction for next year, and it is like on a serious note, is that I think that uh, I would hope to see that the beginnings of uh, a very difficult conversation that we're gonna have to start having about how men and boys are socialized. And I feel like that has really been uh, a really missing element of, it's a lot of like, here's, further behavior that you shouldn't do and very little conversation of how did these mean men get here? 
Uh, so that's I'm, I'm very, hoping that that starts. Very valid, thank you. Okay, and shameless plug, exclaim.ca? Exclaim.ca and uh, still in print in 2018 and, uh, <laughs> and let's hope still about the music industry. Save journalism. Yeah, that's awesome. All right, Roly, do you want to go? Yeah, my prediction for um, 2018, um, Toronto Raptors make uh, the NBA Finals. If, if it could ever, if this is the year that it could like take place. It's, it's realistic. It's you not guys sounding are... so crazy. It's still unlikely, but it's not. There's a chance. Miguel, it's I, Rolly's I time. Good. You're cutting into Rolly's time right now. Should we down. do a basketball podcast? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. This changes up real quick. OG Ananobi, <laughs> rookie of the year. Um, <laughs> then I'll talk. And my plug is: I have a new album coming out January 19th, 2018. <laughs> Check it out. I'm very excited uh, for people to hear the record. I've been lucky to hear it. And Roly and I had a good chat uh, a week or two ago, and it's going to be on the podcast. We went through the whole record. Yeah, it's going to hit the net soon. Yeah, it's going to hit the net on iTunes, which I like to plug for some reason all the time. Miguel. Um, I think uh, that, unfortunately, Donald Trump is a defining element of our, all of our lives, and there's a lot of, like, bizarre liberal hope for this impeachment that is never going to happen. So I think that my hope for 2018 is a democratic flip of Congress, which is um, unfortunately also like a, still an uphill climb, but I think it's, 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 you know, there's a good chance. And I think that Congress is extremely powerful in the United States and can help counter a lot of the negativity coming from Donald Trump and the administration. I am a comedian. Sorry about that. <laughs> I don't know why this keeps happening. It's probably my fault, but every fun talk I want to have ends up being very dark and heavy. I guess that's just me. Is it oh, my fault? My, my shameless plug is... Um, You're just going to ignore the... Yeah, I am. I heart because. pouring I just did? I just remembered my plug. Okay, fine. Go my, ahead. My plug is uh, the show I've been doing in Toronto, Rap Battles, we've been doing for eight years, and we have our 100th show coming up wow. in April. And it's going to be a big deal. It's going to be fun. And everyone should come check it out. Okay. Where's that? A comedy bar in Toronto. Comedy bar. Okay. Thank you. Emma? So, this is my hope. And it's not going to happen. But my hope, like my dream, my fantasy, my deep sexual fantasy. Oh, my God. Is that, it's not sexual. Is that Michelle Obama, wherever she is, it's not her turn and she doesn't have to do it. But that she goes like, okay, I have to handle this. And she decides that in 2020, she'll throw her hat in the ring and just be like, fuck it, it's gotten too bad, I gotta do it. Because huh. I love her, and I love him, and I think that that was very, very special, and I wish, and I hope, and I know it's not gonna happen, but that would be my dream. I don't want to rain on your parade, but she hates being a public figure. Hates it. Yeah, I know that. That's why I said in. it's my fantasy, okay, I'm sorry, Jesus. It's my fantasy, let me have this. Okay, sorry. It's been rough. Emma, okay, and uh, do you want to talk about the Beaverton at all? Or? Well, yeah, you can watch, watch it if you want. If you don't like it, it's okay. It the Beaverton? Yeah. There you go. Okay, and finally, Aaliyah. Um, my hope is that oh. Meghan Markle breaks the royal family. And, <laughs> and also uh, that, more seriously, that um, the fact that all these disclosures are happening results in more structural supports for resolving this important societal problem that aren't the courts and the criminal justice system which have failed in many ways. So I hope that we look towards like restorative practices or that there are more supports for people who are interested in doing that to resolve this very pervasive issue. Um, my plug is that uh, my comedy set that's gonna happen in June is incredible. <laughs> and that um, my prediction is that everyone in this room and who listens to this podcast will subscribe to The Imposter on iTunes. Excellent. All right. <laughs> All right. Well, we got to wrap it up. Uh, once again, uh, thanks for uh, being here at uh, Long Night, at Long Winter. And uh, if you'd like to uh, hear this uh, episode on my podcast, it's Creative Control, uh, Creative Control with two Ks. It's available on every podcast platform. I'd also like to thank... Uh, all our sponsors, Fresh Books, Hello Fresh, Pizza Trocadero, The Bookshelf, Planet Bean Coffee, and Granddad's Donuts. Those, that's everyone. I'd like to thank the Long Winter crew. I'd like to thank Dave McKinnon. I'd like to thank Paul for doing sound. I'd like to thank the bicycles. I'd like to thank Linda. Thank you all for being here. Thanks for being good people. We'll talk to you next time. Happy New Year. Good night, everybody. Mm -hmm.